What's up, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of Day One Radio right here on Live Hip Hop Daily. I'm Maurice Garland, still on here with my man, Brandon Peters. What's happening, man? What's good, brother? Good to be back virtually in the house, man. We uh, For the last few weeks, we've been talking to folks that are, you know, doing their thing right now within this. This uh, We're hoping it's a movement and not a moment. And uh, thankfully, we got one of our, our folks on here who, who also happens to be, you know, one of the dopest up and coming coaches in the NBA. Uh, always great to have a fellow Bay Area guy on here. So I want to uh, welcome uh, Hawks head coach Lloyd Pierce to the show. How you doing, brother? I'm good. What's happening, fellas? Good, good man. man. Good, good. So, I mean, we're going to jump right into it, bro. Uh, this A lot of times in the, in the NBA or in professional sports period, we only have, you know, one or two players and coaches that are, are vocal about how they feel about social issues and things of that nature, man. What gave you the courage? Cause you're not really a, a flamboyant out there person with your personality. What gave you the courage to be able to speak up and, and use your voice during this pivotal time? Um, you know, a lot of things, obviously you mentioned it earlier about it being a movement and not just a, uh, a moment. And I think, you know, right now we all kind of understand that this is a, a very pivotal and critical time uh, as African American men sp specifically. Um, so I think for me, I, I have a platform. I have an opportunity to really address a lot of people, and I have a lot of I have an opportunity to have access to a lot of people. And I think it's very important that when you're in a position like that, you take advantage of it. And so that doesn't exclude me from doing that off the court as well. Um, I've never been, you know, I'm in this position for a lot of reasons. And, and one of them is I'm not afraid to speak my mind, yeah. um, which is when you're in a leadership position, you have to have the capability and willingness to do that. And so, uh, you know, what I'm not doing is, is <laughs> I'm not being outside of the box. I'm actually being within what I've always been, um, you know, pretty fearless and, and pretty willing to say whatever I feel um, if it, if I know it benefits and protects me. And so that's really what this is about. When I say me, I'm not just speaking of myself. I'm speaking of, uh, me as African, as, as an African American man and, uh, an African American father and an African American husband. So when I say I'm trying to protect myself, I'm trying to protect that whole species of who I am. So the salute, man, we appreciate it for sure. I'm sure, you know, everybody can't necessarily get to you but I, I i see the comments and i see people talking and people definitely appreciate somebody of your stature stepping up and stepping out and doing things that you don't necessarily have to do so salute for that for sure um there's a you're, you're a member they put together a seven person committee um the the nbaca did and you have been very you know vocal in leadership with that so we hear about, you know, these committees and things like that all the time. But I, I feel like this was a little different because I heard you guys were meeting regularly. I had a lot of calls. Tell us a little bit about that committee and like what you guys are doing right now. Yeah, it's, it's actually been um, it's been pretty, pretty interesting to get, you know, I think to get anybody on a, on a regular schedule <laughs> is always a challenge when you have 30 right. head coaches. Um, committed to a, a regular schedule every Monday where you we're getting, you know, 98% attendance, you know, there's always something for one guy, you know, and, and we all kind of get that for the most part, we've gotten full attendance and you know, we've had, uh, I believe four or five head coaches meetings. We've also had six or seven, uh, committee meetings in addition to the, so we, we have been active. We've been engaged. We've been unified. Um, and really, it's, it, some of it's been educational. The earlier portions of those meetings have been educational, having Obama Foundation, uh, Brian Stevenson from Equal Justice Initiative, uh, Color of Change, some, some representatives from there, um, Campaign Zero, some representatives from there. Um, it really just being educated on what's going on and what are some of the, the necessary steps we as coaches should take to... Um, to use with our platform and how we can use our platform uh, most efficiently. 
And so it's it's been um, it's been really a lot of information, a lot of brainstorming, a lot of sharing ideas, um, but a lot of conversation about what's going on in our world that uh, we have to address and talk. You know, our league is 75 percent, close to 80 percent African American in terms of the players, and, and we coach those guys. And so, you know, us being educated about what's going on is going to help us educate our players about what's going on. Obviously, a lot of them know. Uh, but do they know the levels and the intricacies of system, systemic racism and how that affects them or could affect them and affects their family and their communities and, and what they potentially could do about it with their platform and the reach that they have? So, you know, we're trying to stay in our lane. You know, I don't know a whole lot about, you know, I, I wasn't a, a poli sci major. I haven't lobbied for anything. Um, you know, I, I get that. Um, and I'm being educated on all of these things. I'm not a history major, even though I am a black man that doesn't, you know, ensure that I know everything about our history in the country as African-Americans. And so the time we spend is being educated on what we can do uh, that we feel comfortable doing um, and that we know is possible. You know, we're, we're not trying to reinvent the wheel. And the biggest thing we're focused on is keeping the conversation alive. I have a mic in front of my face. Every time I play a basketball game, every time the Atlanta Hawks play the basketball game, there's a mic in front of me. And so if you can put a mic in front of me, I can bring this topic up about racism in our country. Uh, and I can let our fans know, I can let the basketball community know. And if all 30 of us coaches do that, uh, we're, we're part of the solution in keeping this dialogue alive and really encouraging and supporting the people that are on the front lines, uh, trying to get legislative changes, trying to get... Um, policy reform, trying to get economic empowerment for the African-American community, but also trying to get education and curriculum into the schools. You know, a lot of things of that nature. We want to be able to speak those things into existence by keeping the conversation alive uh, and really supporting the people that are on the front lines and really uh, impacting change. Like with that conversation, like, you know, you said there's 30 head coaches on, um, like you are one of the younger ones in that group. Um, what were those conversations like? Was there a lot of ground zero starting for that? Because, you know, you want to assume that older heads, white or black, know some things. But sometimes you're like, damn, bro, you've been on this planet that long and you had no idea. You know what I'm saying? Like, what, what have the conversations been like, you know what I'm saying, like, as a whole? You know, I mean, honestly, one of the things we try to avoid is everybody sharing, sharing their, you know, their instance of racism. I mean, mm -hmm. we all have a personal story and we, we, we do that all day. I mean, we could sit there and, and tell stories about, yeah, this one time in high school, I got pulled over and, you know, that, that's, that we kind of know, we, we assume we know that, um, because we're seeing that we, we don't, I don't have to share a story. I'm seeing it on TV and I'm seeing other people's story. Mm -hmm. uh, the real issue is how do we, how do we really talk about, <laughs> you know, the the uh, the history of our country, the history of racial injustice. How did it start? Why are why as why are some people now recognizing Juneteenth as a holiday? You know, right. why is there a lack of understanding there? Um, you know, we celebrate Juneteenth and the emancipation of, of slavery, but we don't talk about the Reconstruction period right after. Why why does no one know? You know, the intricacies of all the details that have gone into our history to understand. Uh, when we see a black man killed by a uh, by a police officer, that that isn't a result of just that incident and what happened that night. That's a result of the, our history. And so we're trying to focus on history and education and, and what we can do moving forward to try and better um, a lot of systemic issues and try and change a lot of systemic issues. And you're seeing that right now. I, I think we are seeing as a part of the moment we're seeing a lot of uh, radical changes. The Mississippi flag being voted to come down. Uh, you're seeing statues <laughs> being torn down. You're seeing uh, police uh, income and, and, and funding be reallocated. So we're seeing stuff that's probably a result more so of the moment. Uh, we want to keep the conversation alive so it's more of a movement, as, right. as Brandon talked about. Absolutely. Man, you, you spoke before that your job as a head coach is not just to develop better 
pro players, but also to help these guys develop as men, especially because you have a pretty young team. How do, how does like what you're doing with those conversations outside of even your team, how does that translate? Because I feel like a lot of guys who are young, especially 19, 20, 21, come from that, you know, racism isn't as bad angle. And also, you know, you're insulated from certain things when you have a certain amount of money and a certain amount of fame. So like, how does that whole conversation change now that all of these things are happening and that stuff is front of mind for even your younger players? I think a lot of time in professional sports, um, and I'm not just speaking of basketball, I'm, I'm speaking of young men uh, coming into um, high levels of income uh -huh. instantly. You know, you go from, from making zero in college <laughs> to having $3 million in your bank account within six months. Um, right. And so the conversation has always been um, of understanding how quickly things can change. You know, if you come into money quick and you just start buying and spending and living a different life uh, without really putting it away or saving, you, you, you know, you can live on a certain amount of income. And the rest of the stuff is where you start thinking wise about what you're doing with your money to build wealth, uh, to build a savings, to build a, a portfolio. And so as you speak to players about the obvious, um, that income understand, understanding of, of economic empowerment, um, it's the same conversation. You know, one injury and your career could be over. So what are you going to do? How are you going to prepare? Don't think it can't happen to you. Well, this is the same conversation we're having with racism. You know, mm -hmm. just because you're an NBA player and, you know, you've, you, you've been – put in this position where people look at you as, oh, he's different. You know, Jay-Z wrote that song, right? <laughs> you know, oh, I'm OJ. Okay. Yeah, exactly. You know, when you start talking about, oh, you think you're different. All right. Well, wait till that incident occurs. And, and, and no one is asking for or looking for something to happen to someone so they understand it better. But I think what happens is a family member or a friend or someone you know is a result of racial profiling, targeting, or discrimination, uh, and it impacts you, then you, you, start, you start to get it a little bit more. You start to understand it because it's hit home. Uh, we don't want it to hit home for you to understand it. So the conversation is definitely, listen, none of us, myself included, and that's how I address it, myself included, you know, when I take this Hawks thing off, don't nobody know me. I'm just a regular black dude. So I can't I can't hide behind a Hawks head coach title. And, you know, because I have a BMW. <laughs> and if I'm driving a BMW and I'm a black man, you know, that ain't protecting me. That's probably uh, yeah. putting me in more danger in, in a lot of ways. And, and I understand that. So try and explain that to our guys, the importance of uh, knowing that they are not ex they are not exempt from any of this yeah no nah, absolutely and that's the beauty of this 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 time you know this isn't a normal basketball season this isn't a normal summer i don't even know if we can call it summer right now i don't know right. what, what, what <laughs> uh, yeah and so because of that i think you have to agree with both sides because we're, we're just in we're in uncharted territory trying to navigate through this and so i get like i i want to see basketball and, and i think a lot of people want to play basketball and so i get that that side and then there's also you know the side where i'm here with my family i haven't i haven't done much in atlanta i don't leave my house much i don't go places um, and i'm not looking forward to trying to do it anytime soon mm -hmm. so i get that part as well um but the biggest thing in terms of uh, our um, our commitment to this movement and addressing real issues in our country regarding racism, um, there is no greater platform that that we have as as athletes and coaches and as a league. That there is no greater platform than when that TV screen comes on and our players, our coaches, our league. Uh, our networks are televising the conversation and the mm -hmm. movement and our players specifically 
um, are showing it and demonstrating it and talking about it. And so, you know, what does that do? It, it puts us, it puts a, it puts a hole, it puts a challenge on every network, you know, now the ABCs and the ESPNs and whoever, they've got to be supportive of it. If they're not, you know, it's a call to action. All of our sponsors that will be on commercials, um, you know, we've mm. got to vet those uh, endorsements that are coming through. Are those companies supportive of Black Lives Matter? Um, you know, and so our players, you know, they work with shoe companies and, and all the other endorsement deals. Um, what you're saying is if you're not on the right side of the fence, people are calling you out. And so mm. when we have that platform, you know, I think everybody is getting on the right side of the fence or they're being called out and our platform is large. And so to be able to address the systemic issues, to do it internally, uh, to self-reflect, we have an opportunity to really make a lot of people self-reflect and, and figure out where they stand as a corporation, as a partner, as a sponsor in our league. Um, and I think that's that's a big issue. That's a that's a big area that we can address um, with our platform. For sure. Why do, why do you think that the NBA, you know, historically handles these things so much better than any other pro league, even some majority black pro leagues? Um, you know, I think there's there's always been a progressive uh, approach by it really started with, with commissioner stern um to really elevate the league to a global league you know to be to have games shown in in, in every country to be able to take our league and, and play in different countries um, the marketing aspect of it the the fan experience the, the different things that we have done when you go back to the 80s and you think of where our league is now where our game is now and how much revenue and income comes in it's because of the marketing and the the international exposure and the tv and so we've always tried to um you know our our players are identifiable more yeah. so than football and basketball you know football they're hidden behind the helmets and the, and the pads and baseball they just play so many games uh mm -hmm. You know, you really just notice kind of the pitcher and, and the best hitters. You, you don't really get to see or recognize most. Our game is different. Our game, you, you see everybody. Every play, you get to highlight who that player is. And we've taken full advantage of marketing that in that in that fashion. So all of our players, you know, from Trey Young to John Collins, all have an opportunity to become basically superstars from an endorsement standpoint um, based on their likability. But they're all visible. And so I think it, it, it trickles down to the to the off the court stuff as well. Our guys, because they get endorsement deals, because they have opportunities to market themselves and create a brand, you know, our guys are, are passionate and strong minded and, 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 and they speak up. And so LeBron James and Chris Paul, you know, very recognizable faces also do TV, also speak out on racial injustice also. And so I don't think the league, uh, even if they want it, could could really limit what the guys are saying that they have their own opportunity they've created their own brand i think the league has done a tremendous job of supporting that and getting behind it and, and joining in with the with the movement for sure so uh for you we kind of glanced over it earlier but it's you know another huge thing going on right now is this pandemic man like how have you been adjusting to it especially you know you have a responsibility to the team, but you also, first and foremost, have a family. Like, how has it been, like, kind of getting into some kind of groove during these last few months? It's easy. It's just, I've just been a work-from-home dad. I mean, it's, <laughs> it's the best way of putting it. Um, you know, we all have readjusted and learned how to how to work online, and, you know, I still get to do that. My, my daughter's asleep right now, but... If she were up, she, she'd be trying to run into this room and <laughs> get on a Zoom call because she knows she can see her face on Zoom. So, um, you know, you just you just get adjusted that way. I think uh, um, I've actually been busier because there's been more meetings and calls. And, you know, instead of at practice, I can connect with all 15 guys. Now I have to try and do it individually on the phone. 
mm. uh, which I'm not accustomed to doing, just sitting on my phone all day. This is that bec- that has become a new reality for me, uh, which I, I despise. I hate being on the phone. <laughs> right. <laughs> me, me too, brother. Me too. All of us. All of us. <laughs> so, you know, it's just it's just the reality. I I do not leave much. I, you know, I go to Piedmont Park in the mornings. That's why I'm up early. I normally do early morning drives and audio books and then walk around Piedmont Park and then kind of start my day after doing that. But, um, you know, you just have to readjust. Again, I'm a, I'm a work from dad home now. Yeah, so how, how the players, dad, yeah. <laughs> how the players been adjusting? I mean, you know, I mean, not to paint everybody with a broad brush, but I mean, young cats, no matter what profession they're in, they actually like being on the phone. They FaceTime and, all that, or how they've been adjusting, are they liking this reality? I'm like, oh shit, I ain't gotta go nowhere. I just stay on the phone at the crib. No, I, I, think, <laughs> I think honestly, I think they're just bored, mm. uh, and there's no way of putting it, no other way of putting it. They're, they're bored, you know. Obviously, I'm sure most of them play video games. Some of them work out and try and hoop where they can or how they can. Uh, but I would love to say our guy or reading books and picking up hobbies and new crafts or studying, you know, business endeavors, things, things of that nature. Um, but, but the reality is I'm sure a lot of them are just bored. <laughs> I'm sure, uh, for you, you know, they pushed the draft back and, and what I've heard a lot from some talking heads and people that work in the league is that man, like, this is difficult because there isn't really scouting. Like we don't have the Chicago combine. We don't have any of that. So with the draft coming up, and I guess it's what October, and and you guys will have a lottery pick. Like, how how are you handling that? Because this is completely different from how you handled it your first season as a head coach. Um, you know our team is, and this is this isn't my area. I kind of join in with our staff, but gotcha. they're uh, they're evaluating players. They've been evaluating players. You know, you miss out on a, a tremendous opportunity that happens in the tournament and then the um, pre-draft combines and, and events. So obviously that's all been taken away from everyone. So you have to rely on on the historical stuff, you know, stuff you saw in high school, the stuff you saw mm-hmm. in, in players' first couple years of college, wow. and then whatever you're able to see this year. Um, but they've, we've been diligent. You know, the draft is October 15th. Uh, still – three months away, four months away, and we've been meeting for the last three months. So there's been a lot of dialogue and conversations on each player, some Zoom interviews with some of the players that are in the draft, um, and just sharing information. So we're building up our board uh, in preparation for the draft. We just have a lot of time to do it. <laughs> Got you. So switching, uh, not those are the young players. Now you you had the, the, the pleasure of, of coaching one of – the OGs in the league who just retired, man. Vince Carter. What what, were you, what are your thoughts on that? And any any funny stories from from your year and a half, two years together? No, I mean obviously it's an honor. You guys all know Vince as I know him. I mean, we grow up, grew up <laughs> watching Vince, watching the highlights, watching the mm-hmm. you know one of the greatest athletes, if not the greatest athlete. Uh, in terms of dunking the basketball and, and highlight reels that we've ever, I've ever seen. I mean, he, yeah. he's definitely, you know, him and Dominique here in Atlanta, yeah. definitely two of the greatest I've ever watched in court, uh, in game dunkers, and, and you know, just ferocious attacking the basket. Uh, so it, it was an honor for me to coach him and coach him the last two years of his career. Um, you know, the good thing having an old, an old head like Vince is we connect. We connect from a musical standpoint. You know, mm-hmm. he and I are eight months different. You know, he, he grew up on the same stuff I grew up on. So, you know, listening to Outkast, and we do this on, on the road. We always pick, um, you know, if we're in Philly, we pick Meek Mill or we pick, you know, whoever. Mm-hmm. You know, the young guys probably normally want to, when we go to shoot around, they, they want to hear Meek Mill. You know, me and me and Vince, uh, let's throw some Beanie Siegel on. There. It's, it's a different. There's always a different approach because I get I get Vince to side with me, or I get to side with Vince. And we always choose whatever city we're in. We choose an artist from that city to kind of intro us that morning. Uh, so we would always connect like that and have fun with the guys because a lot of guys wouldn't know some of the old school stuff that we were listening to. Um, 
which is cool, you know, and I think it was cool for Vince that the coaches, you know, were of, of his age and he mm-hmm. could connect with us that way as well. But, you know, just a tremendous guy, a great person more than anything. That's the one thing I didn't know, didn't know him well before he, he got here and just an unbelievable person. And he'll be successful in his post career, probably more so than his playing career mm-hmm. because of uh, his credibility that he's earned up. You think he's going to go the TV route? Because I can definitely see him doing that. Yeah, I mean, he spent his past sub- summers uh, on TV, you know, doing some right. junior Olympic stuff in Orlando. He, he would do summer league with uh, NBA TV um, for the NBA during the summer. So he, he's been prepping himself for uh, uh, a lot of TV activity, and, and I'm sure he'll have a lot of suitors. What, what are you kind of listening to right now to, to keep you going, man? Man, that's a good question. Um, you know, I'm, I'm, I normally stick to what I stick to. And so I still, you know, when I'm in a Nipsey mood, I still play Nipsey. Uh, I just got the new Run the Jewels. And yeah. I think that's a tremendous album just because it's, you know, right off the bat, the first single is his DJ Premier. So, mm. yeah, you know, I grew up as a, a big, big Gangstar fan. Um, trying to think of what um, I, I go back and forth. You know, I I, I don't listen to a lot of new stuff. Uh-huh. Um, you know, I'll take a song here and there, but <laughs> I don't listen to a lot of new stuff. And, and when I do listen to something, I normally listen to kind of a vibe. So I've I've uh, you know, a friend of mine was telling me, actually it was Grant Hill. Grant was uh, he sent me a video on Father's Day. And, and, uh, you know, he had some, some public enemy in the background. And I said, I, I see you old head with the, with the PE. He said, it's been a public enemy type of month. So mm-hmm. uh, I said, I hear you. I said, mm-hmm. uh, I said, you know, it's headed toward the X clan type of month. <laughs> uh, so it, it was pretty cool. Cause we shared that moment. We were laughing about it, but I thought it was even, even, I, I mean, I have to hit Grant up because I haven't seen the BET Awards, but I did see the intro. And all yeah. of a sudden you see Public Enemy's intro with Nas and the remix of it. So yeah. Grant was on to something. He, he knew it was the Public mm-hmm. Enemy type of month. Mm-hmm. Absolutely, absolutely. And Public Enemy just dropped a new song with Premier, I believe. Yeah, it, it's yeah. Part of the song too. yeah I saw yeah. they were on Sway. Uh, uh, Chuck D was on Sway yesterday in the morning. So uh, uh, I imagine he had something going. Yeah, everything comes full circle. Everything comes full circle for sure. But yeah, man, we're going to, I know you got to get to your workout. We're going to let you get out of here. But I have one last question before we go. Good friend of yours, uh, Steve Nash, guy you play with, always known as one of the best shooters in the league. You also coach one of the best shooters in the league and Trey Young. In your eyes, who do you think is a better shooter, Steve <laughs> or Trey? Well, I, I, I coached the best shooter in the league, and that's Steph Curry. That's true. Left that one out. <laughs> that's true. That, that, that guy, you know, I'm a Warriors fan, so that goes without saying. I, that's like yeah. saying, who's the king in New York? You ain't got to mention Jay-Z and Nas. You got to talk about the other guy. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, no, it, I mean, you know, the thing I always tell people, and, and this is the old barbershop argument, is you got to build up the data. And mm. Trey is on track to becoming a really elite shooter in our league. But you got to build up the data. Uh, I can't knock, I can't knock my guy Nash and, and anybody to tell you that Nash, for nine straight years, led the NBA in offensive efficiency. Uh, his mm. team, you know, the team that he played on. Nash is also part of that extremely elite club of shooting 90, 90, 40, and yeah. 50, 90, 90 from the free throw line, 40 from the three, and 50 overall. Um, so the data, the data you, mm-hmm. you gotta support, uh, but Trey is, Trey is definitely going to be, uh, you know, I don't know how many guys in their second year average 29 points and 10 assists. And that's right. what Trey has done. And so his data will build up and he's going to continue to do that. And he's going to continue to put up great numbers and great shooting displays and great showing scoring displays and great offensive displays. Hopefully he's a guy that can do what Nash did and, have that type of offensive efficiency for his career, uh, but he, he's got to—he got to just—you got to put in some time. 
you know, the time yeah. will come and the time was, uh, is, is, is on his side. And uh, he's off to an unbelievable start. For sure, for sure. Last thing, my Warriors obviously won't be there. Um, you guys are not going to the 22-team league in Orlando. So as a fan stepping out, like, who do you think we'll see in those finals? Man, I, I got no idea. You know, this is this isn't – there is no home court. There is no – away court there are no fans there is no travel mm. um you know you, what you're gonna figure out is is from a competitive and mental standpoint you know who who can bring it you mm. know who mentally is tough enough to bring it without fans to be that competitor and and something tells me we're gonna see an underdog we're gonna see we're gonna see somebody step up you know i don't know if it's boston or toronto um you know out west I don't I don't know where to go. I don't know if Dallas sneaks in there or Denver, who's kind of been that, you know, Denver doesn't play to a huge fan base. You know, Lakers mm -hmm. travel well. Milwaukee right. travels well. Uh, some of those teams with those elite stars, they're used to playing well on the road because they get everybody's best. You know, Denver just shows up and goes. So you, you yeah. never know. I, I have no idea. I, I do think there'll be an underdog sneaking in there. Um, I don't know if it's going to be a favorite type of uh, event in Orlando. Got you, got you. Well, appreciate you, brother. Thank you for All joining good. us. Yeah, yeah, no doubt. We appreciate y'all listening uh, through our partners at CLNS Media. We appreciate y'all watching with Live Hip Hop Daily. And uh, as always, follow us on Day One Radio. That's D-A-Y, the number one radio. And we'll see you next week with another dope show. Peace. Peace. All right.